Hmm. Hello. Hmm. Well, we made it this far. Here we are. <laughs> Yay. You might, if you feel like it, um, look at your fellow yogis, the other pages. Uh, mudita mudita moments when we start to see uh, you yeah for me <laughs> so mudita hmm so um i just wanted you all to know that Kelly is hosting today, and thank you, Kelly, for coming on and doing this for us. Thank you. Mm. Mm. So um, we'll do a guided sitting and a short talk, see how that goes. Mm. And we'll uh, begin with just inclining the attention to abiding in kindness. And there are many different ways we can approach that, but sometimes keeping it very simple so that when you notice your mind has gotten lost in a train of thought, that when you come back, you just might even say, may I abide in kindness. Our kindness. And then after a while, it can be that something comes up, physical sensation, thoughts, sounds, emotions, just whatever appears. It's just like a coming back into Kindness, being more of a foreground. And the objects of the kindness coming and go, going in the background. And sometimes that field of awareness, that abiding can be very vast. So it doesn't necessarily feel like you're coming back from something to something, but just the kindness is everywhere.
So the thoughts come and go in that vast field of kindness. Our body sensations come and go in the vast field of kindness. Anger, sadness, joy, kindness. Fear, sounds, thoughts, body sensation. And sometimes the kindness might feel if it's too much effort or not accessible, of course, it can be care, tenderness. And you can let it just shift into just being vulnerable or sensitive itself. And it's something that you can shift back into. So you could be aware of the breath. Coming and going in this very light awareness field of kindness. for a while. Mm. Letting it shift into just that pure sensitivity of sensations coming and going by themselves. So see what happens. You might just find staying in that a stronger field of the abiding in kindness or having it come and go. Letting it shift into the vipassana. 
but then bringing it back. Or just shifting into the moment to moment, a sixth sense door, awareness. Letting things be just as they are because they are just as they are.
I've been um, kind of creating a loose structure for the next four, well, this Sunday and the, the next three of the, um, you know, Vipassana with a metta flavor the first week, this first week, Vipassana with a <laughs> compassion flavor the second week, that kind of structure, you know, mudita with a Vipassana flavor, or depending on what you want, you know, Vipassana with a mudita flavor for the third week, etc. The <clears throat> Vipassana with an equanimity flavor the fourth week. And um, I'm not expecting everyone to want to do that. So I'm just suggesting that it can be a very loose structure for our time together. Um, so the guided meditation, for example, uh, t tonight, today was just a, um, a little kind of nudge or suggestion of how you might do that during the week, whether you're brushing hair or brushing teeth or walking or driving or waiting for a bus, you know, whatever, however your life is unfolding, that kind of instruction of the love and kindness is incredibly simple. <laughs> You're not like focusing on objects. You're just like coming back to pretty much your heart center uh, mostly and just saying, um, may I abide in kindness. And it could be once a day. Um, I'm just saying it could be a structure we kind of follow for the month and very light, very light touch. Uh, you could start with compassion instead of... Metta, it'll be the same thing where we're, we're kind of shifting into may I abide with in caring about pain or compassion. So part of my intention of this is um, that um, for four Sundays I'll be doing this with you myself. And also I think the relationship between... Um, the intention to be kind, for example, and peace is, is a very important exploration. Or the intention to be kind and liberation, that exploration within ourselves, not just in a sitting, but just like in general, um, that it, it's such a, a worthy endeavor. Uh, and I'm, again, I'm not suggesting it's full on. It could be that you notice during the sitting something or not, or nothing, <laughs> right? I'm not, this is not a heavy hand, handed instruction. It's much more kind of getting that sense of um, letting go a lot of the objects as the foreground and then uh, finding this just place of rest, of uh, like a little nest, <laughs> of um, even just repeating softly the word or getting a taste of it. It can be, again, tender. It doesn't have to be kind um, or care. Uh, but then at times you might see that it can become all, all pervasive so that rather than w being a little bit more withdrawn from the objects, it's much more that um, it's like the whole uh, field of consciousness or awareness is um, has that light touch of kindness and the objects are coming and going in them. And then um, seeing what happens when you let go of it. Seeing what happens if you, you, you just notice the objects disappearing and then um, just staying with that process of just simply being with things, sixth sense door, moment to moment aware. See, see what happens. And I'm hoping <laughs> that one thing that one starts to see is that there can be a relationship between um, you 
having that intention to be kind, um, it's not a command, but it, it can shift our relationship of resistance to things as they are to, to it's again always the same instruction with the Brahma Vihara is that they, they soften the heart enough that we can melt the resistance. It's a melting of the resistance without, that, that style of instruction is without much effort actually. It's a, it's a style where you're just sort of trusting that it's there and you're letting it kind of build up like water kind of filling the body, mind, heart, but it's kindness filling and then opening up. Um, and one can see maybe that uh, whatever it might be that we are resisting, that because the kindness is a, a base, uh, there's more chance of finding acceptance and peace with, with what's happening. When my, um, when Steve's mom was 90, uh, she fell in the bathtub and um, she was not conscious. I think it was at least three days. Um, there was a, there was discussion that she might die and um, I, I was supposed to go to Burma but um, because of circumstances, for some great reason, Steve got a visa, he went, and so I was um, there with his mom for three days at the hospital. And um, she was a very, very early riser, and she loved having her a little cup of coffee. She had the same little cup. Um, all the years I knew her, you know, just, I still have it. Uh, it's a treasure. Uh, and she would go out and get the newspaper, you know, the the old days, early in the dark, and she'd have her coffee with the paper. So I had that ready for her, like in case whenever she woke up, that I didn't care what time it was. I, I always had her newspaper there and then would the the, nur you know, the nurse's station was ready for the getting the coffee so she woke up and I had the newspaper there and um, I really wasn't paying attention to the news very much I was so busy and it it was a um, another war had started it was the headline you know and she lived through a lot of wars she was there for Pearl Harbor um, and uh, so she was so grateful. She looked at me and she was so grateful. She didn't want to talk about anything. She she opened up the paper and she, it was like it took her breath away and then she paused and she looked at me and she said, I don't, I don't know if I want to live through another war. And I said, well, <laughs> what are you going to do? Here you are. <laughs> you know, looks like, looks like we got another war. And I hope you'll decide to stay around um, for a while. So I don't know if you're feeling that about the last few days, but, you know, there are so many. And uh, we have another war. And... Um, Without this uh, kindness base, I think it's very hard to stay connected with the truth of things as they are uh, without that sense of um, care, kindness, right? The equanimity um, without conditions. I was talking to my older sister the other day before that had started, um, but there's a lot of 
difficulty going on in my family and um she said you know you know what i hate you know and i said what and she said if anybody says it is what it is have you ever heard anybody say it is what it is and i'm like Ah, oh, I don't even want to talk about that, Sandy, because I could tell what was coming. She said, if I hear somebody say, it is what it is, I just want to kill them. I just want to kill them. <laughs> <I'm> like, <laughs> oh. And I said, well, I have a good thing for you to say. Like, this is really naughty. Like I said, when you hear somebody say that and you can't stand it, just say, if you say so. <laughs> If you say so. And then she couldn't help it. She burst out laughing. So she kind of let go of that like intense uh, hatred of that expression. But I think, you know, um, as we know with all these kind of um, expressions, spiritual expressions, they can be so misused. And they can be so misused in um, certain settings. So sometimes saying that particular thing <laughs> is like not helpful. Like if I said that to my sister, it would not be helpful. I know that. I know she would hate it, right? And it's like, so I wouldn't even think of even admitting to her that I teach that, right? <laughs> she, she, it's like, forget it. That's like end of the relationship, right? I know that. Um, but it's like, um, I love her honesty, I bathe, I bathe in her honesty. I mean, the it's um, one would some people call it extremely negative, <laughs> but I, I actually feel like it's how she sees things. And um, if you're resisting something, it hearing it is what it is, but rather than maybe somebody being kind, yeah. How 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 is that? What is, what does that do for the the heart? I was um. Hmm, don't lose the page. There's there's so many ways to try to um, talk about loving kindness, and I think that essentially is what I was just. Um, trying to do around what my sister was saying about hearing somebody say uh, it is what it is <laughs> but it's too um, flippant in that in these moments it's not de deep uh, and so um, I think the same around meta that there's a way that we can approach it when there isn't a depth of the unconditional with it it's it's um there's there's a motivation of control with it and i was trying to find an example with sri nazargadatta and that this is a long question and answer period of some man that um felt his mom never loved him Um, so Nizargadatta is asking him questions, and I don't want to go on too long with this, but um, so I'll start with the, it gets pretty um, edgy at this point. He's having an interchange with him about it, and he says, and Nizargadatta says, of the two, what would you prefer? to love or be loved? And the answer is, I would rather have both, but I can see that to love is greater, nobler, deeper. To be loved is sweet, but it does not make one grow. So Nazargadatta says, can you love on your own or must you be made to love? And so he starts to go in there with him 
and he says, um, one must meet somebody lovable, of course. My mother was not only not loving, she was also not lovable. This is really important. And so Nazargadatta says, well, what makes a person lovable? Is it not the being loved? I think that's enough, but I'm going to go on. But that, even in that, it's so beautiful. What makes a person lovable? Is it not being loved? F- first you love, and then you, you look for reasons. And the guy says, it can be the other way around. You love what makes you happy. So then Zargadatta says, but what makes you happy? And the guy says, there's no rule about it. The entire subject is highly individual and unpredictable. And Nisargadatta says, right, whichever way you put it, unless you love, there is no happiness. But does love make you always happy? Is not the association of love with happiness a rather early infantile association (laughs) of love with happiness, a rather early infantile stage? When the beloved suffers, don't you suffer too? Or do you cease to love because you suffer? Must love and happiness come and go together? Is love merely the expectation of pleasure? So this man says, of course not. There can be much suffering in love. I'll go on a little bit, two more paragraphs. So Nazargadatta says, then what is love? Is it not a state of being rather than a state of mind? Is it not a state of being rather than a state of mind? Must you know that you love in order to love? Did you not love your mother unknowingly? Your craving for her love, for an opportunity to love her, is it not the movement of love? Is not love as much a part of you as as consciousness of being? You sought the love of your mother because you loved her. So he says, but she would not let me. And Nazargadatta says, she could not stop you. So he says, then why was I unhappy all of my life? And he says, Nisargadatta says, because you did not go down to the very roots of your being. It is, it is your complete ignorance of yourself that covered up your love and happiness and made you seek for what you had never lost. <laughs> love is will, the will to share your happiness with all. Being happy, making happy, this is the rhythm of love. I love that particular interchange because you can you can hear Nisargadatta just kind of um, in a way going for the jugular with such a, a pure kindness and pure love. Yeah, like he's really saying, uh, your mother couldn't stop you, right? Loving her, but yet. You know, it's like this karmic knot in the sky, like that was so deep. And then Nisargadatta is saying, "This is you got to go deep." Yeah. And and I feel like the Brahma Vihara of Metta is like that. It's like very very purifying. It brings us very deep. You know, we <laughs> so that I'm not suggesting that that kindness is easy. I'm saying that that style of doing the practice is a little more effortless because one isn't kind of sticking to objects. Not that that isn't a good method. I'm just saying that in this style, I think it's easier when we're not on retreat to like 
just remember to say once in a while, <laughs> uh, may I abide in kindness. You're not trying to make anything happen. And in fact, it's like that kind of gives space, right? So that if fear did come up, there might be a way that one could be kind toward the fear. Because you're just abiding. It's not an agenda, not a project, not an expectation. So that then when we get to the subject of a, of a war and like what that requires of us, right? What it requires of the heart to even remotely be connected at times and to um, be able to wish well. I've um, I I had a really bad flu <laughs> oh, for over a month, and uh, so I tend to um, have a relationship with walking in my neighborhood that um, is is very little. Like it, when I get sick, or you know. I can. S I wonder always if the neighbors can tell what's going on with me just about like how little my walk is or how <laughs> long it is because it's nowhere. Ver it's not very much where you can go. Uh, and so um, I started feeling better enough to go down the road and uh, a little bit, and I saw a donkey that I hadn't seen for. maybe 14 years. So I used to rent in the neighborhood down in a gulch and the, the stonky lived there. And I used to bring it apples sometimes. And um, so I was so happy to see the stonky. And the donkey lives right on the road, but he, he's living in this like um, menagerie. I, I love this neighbor. She just, she has goats just as pets. Like they're, they're they're just pets, and she has, everything's a pet except for the chickens. You know, the, there's ducks, and there's geese, and there's turkeys, and there's many goats, and it's this little place, um, little yard. <laughs> there's hardly anything green left in it. It's just <laughs> pretty funny. Uh, so now there's a, th there's a little fence, and now the donkey gets to stay there, and I'm so happy for the donkey because it has all these friends. And I wondered if, he remembered me. It didn't seem um, that way. So I decided to get an apple uh, for the donkey. <laughs> so we were standing there. Uh, I don't really care if he remembers me at this point, but I think that what was important was um, really both of us just standing there being to being. And it was such a transmission. It was so wonderful. I felt like for both of us, because I go down there now and we just say hi and it, sometimes I bring an apple, but it's, um, I think that there's a way in which I, I say this a lot. We don't take the time for these things. It doesn't have to be a donkey. It can be a cloud, right, or a frog or a flower. But it's it's like um, it was like after hanging out with a donkey, I had the same connection with everything. 
the pavement, right, the fence, the, the neighbor, you know, the humans, all the other beings. But it's this doorway that I think comes um, from a certain kind of connection. But there was also a certain kind of kindness in my heart. Yeah, it wasn't just without the connection was there, but there was a, a kindness and wanting the donkey to be happy. Like he doesn't, actually there's, <laughs> that, to admit it, there's this big sign there that says do not feed the donkey. <laughs> I have to like <laughs> clarify this. <laughs> and I'm like, oh well, what the hell. I'm going to feed the donkey an apple. Like I do, I don't know, and it says it bites. That's why you're not supposed to feed it. But I'm not going to get bit by the donkey. I don't even put it in its mouth. I put it under the fence and it picks it up and eats it and is very happy. But it's that it's that sense again, if you hear what Nazarg is saying, um, of course that was quite an intense um, description of love that he gave. But it's that sent a sense of like wishing well. It's just wishing well and, and knowing again what that does for our heart. Because that's why I'm trying to explain. Try to pull back from the objects a bit because it's really what the kindness is doing for your heart. Not the object of the kindness. And again, how that shifts our understanding of peace and love. This is a, a poem by, I'm not sure I pronounce her name right, but it's, I, some poets I don't always have to pronounce the names out loud, so I don't, Wislawa Simborska. It's called Clouds. Uh, she was born in Poland, I think 1922 could have been 1928, in the 20s. I think she died in 2012. Clouds. I'd have to be really quick to describe clouds. A split second's enough for them to start being something else. I'm going to say that part again because I think it's so so wonderful. Clouds. I'd have to be really quick to describe clouds. A split second's enough for them to start being something else. Their trademark. They don't repeat a single shape, shade, pose, arrangement. Unburdened by memory of any kind, they float easily over the facts. What on earth could they bear witness to? They scatter whenever something happens. <laughs> Compared to clouds, life rests on solid ground, practically permanent, almost eternal. Next to clouds, even a stone seems like a brother, someone you can trust while they're just distant, flighty cousins. Let people exist if they want, and then die, one after another. Clouds simply don't care what they're up to down there. And so their haughty fleet cruises smoothly over your whole life and mine, still incomplete. They aren't obliged to vanish when they're gone. They don't have to be seen while sailing on. How would you like to feel like that? Not to feel obliged to vanish when you're gone. <laughs> so in terms of our moment-to-moment, -moment, sixth sense door awareness, I think that first paragraph is extraordinarily helpful. 
I'd have to be really quick to describe clouds a split seconds enough for them to start being something else. That's our life. That's it. Moment, that's it. Like that's, it's just like that every moment. It's something appears and disappears, something appears and disappears. And I think that um, there's so many levels to take this. I think that this time of year, if you're above the equator, um, and then of course you're south, it's turning into spring, and here we're into autumn. But I find that um, as much as possible at my home, I try to have, it's so hard now because it's getting darker early and earlier. I think you might notice that. <laughs> but I have this thing where I try to watch the sunset with the cats. Although, since these big winds and the fire happened, they, um, they're pretty skittish uh, still. But they're, they're coming. But they're late. Like, they're <laughs> they keep being late because it's setting earlier and earlier. earlier and it's hilarious because I can look at my, you know, little... Uh, weather thing on my phone and I can see it says every, every day when the sun's going to set and it's getting earlier and earlier. I can't make dinner fast enough. It's like I'm like halfway through dinner now and it's like dark. Like I can't keep up with it but I love it. I run outside because I can see it's going to set and the cats like I'm like where are the cats and then they show up when it set last time and so it'll feel like the season actually turns um slower than that but actually it doesn't but what I love about this time of year is that you actually it's so much more visible the the leaves right um, here we had winter surf the other day like the big huge waves and you know it's and the the currents you can see even if you're driving along the road you see this constant like um, movement of the elements and then in the sky, it's like if you um, do have times when you get up in the night, which I do a lot, it's like the sky is changing. The Venus is up in the morning, Pleiades is up, the winter stars are all rising already. You know, they're, they're up. The winter sky is up. And our little Scorpio and Sagittarius are going down and Sagittarius is pouring tea like for hours and hours. It's like <laughs> it doesn't it's like it's so much fun if you pay attention to the sky and that sense of anicca and impermanence and how um there are so many times where I'll want it to stay the same. But it doesn't. And that the teaching of um, Anicca, Dukkha, Anatta, I think, are so important to um, connect with the way um, nature is and the seasons are, particularly at this time of year, because it is so drastic, it is so apparent. And, and most of us don't really want winter to come, like, so quickly, right? Like, we don't really want most of us don't want that darkness to start settling in. I think there, at least for me, there's some pl place around three o'clock in the afternoon or four, and you're used to like it getting darker much later, and you can feel that winter darkness coming in. And again, I, I find that those times, um, it's why Halloween is so powerful, yeah? It's like you can feel that, that, that feeling of, um, the inevitability of the change in the winter and the season and how moving and powerful it is. So that when, <laughs> this is important, when we shift to our moment-to-moment -moment experience, um, actually that's moving so much, uh, it looks like it's moving so much slower compared to 
a sound disappearing or a thought disappearing or a sight disappearing or an emotion disappearing or you know it's like we that ability to start again and again settling into if the the eye is actually um, seeing the speed of light or the ear is actually hearing the speed of sound yeah that the that the heart center <laughs> is so un- unfathomably sensitive that it can um, perceive thought. And to really be able to um, have that base of kindness so that if it starts to feel like um, overwhelming, which is important, it's like insight, it's insight to understand that it, it's overwhelming, right? That it's, it's um, so much c- contact, separation, contact, separation, contact. It's like this, this intensity of touch, 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 um, that to be able to have a friendliness with it, a kindness with it, can usually allow the attention, the awareness again to soften into that change. So we're actually what we call dropping into it. We're not going through the thought process, right? We're not, we're not going through the thought process to be with things happening. We just are with it happening, moving qu- very quickly. That's what we call dropping in or the dropping into the non-conceptual reality. Because if I say bird, I've already put the brake on it. If I say foot, I've already put the brake on it, right? It stops the flow of, of that um, direct experience of the vibrations and textures that we might call um, car. And then, of course, there's that jump where (sighs) there's that willingness to go through that jumping into the stream, and that includes accepting Vedana. So that stream of um, sixth sense or awareness, of course, is including pleasant, unpleasant, neutral, that stream of pleasant, unpleasant, neutral feeling. And um, can we accept that? So that readiness, the readiness, <laughs> the soft readiness uh, for what's going to happen next versus wanting to control what's going to happen next. You know, that, that shifting from... Um, a controller and controlled to just being with. It's it's a practice again and again of maybe seeing the attention get attached or sticky or pushing away. And that's fine. You just see that movement of a controller and then one can drop back into kindness, <laughs> for example, or dro- drop back into care or drop back into acceptance of things as they are. And it, it, you know, we'll go, th- we'll go through all of these. Um, ah, there it is. Aspects of the Brahma Viharas, but just r- the reminder that it's the equanimity, that unconditional acceptance, that that guards or protects the first three. So that unconditional acceptance of how things are is what actually protects the metta or kindness from from starting to get um, motivated by control or it protects the compassion from getting motivated from con- from control or it protects the appreciating the joy in the world um, or the gratitude from from having a motivation of control in it
and I tend to um, because on online we don't do any bowing but I, it's just just the the reminder that when we do do a full bow and put our forehead on the on the ground that um, the meaning of it is supposed to be that we're making a full offering of our body and mind and heart right it's a f- it's an offering just like this is meant to be um, a gesture of respect or reverence but it's also an offering so it's an offering of our whole being um, to the practice of liberation and Brahma Viharas to this uh, valuing the truth over everything. So just in light of uh, autumn here in Hawaii, the golden plovers from Alaska have been arriving. (laughs) They fly so far without stopping. And I like to um, think about when W.S. Merwin moved to Maui from New York City long ago in 1987. He started to notice the plovers, the golden plovers. And then he started realizing that um, he could never notice them enough. And every time he heard their call, it was like for the first time. And he described the call as a kind of, um, what it elicited in him was a kind of homesickness, a kind of wistfulness and homesickness. And he couldn't tell if that was their, their homesickness and wistfulness or his own. I think that's so beautiful. Uh, And then 10 years later, 1997, he wrote, I sometimes think plovers must experience in their own original way a kind of homesickness. I like thinking of the science of migration, how it works, but the metaphysics of it too. Anyway, as much as we can ever know and not have to prove. So here he is again. Here's a variation on the theme. It's 2015, and this is a poem. Well, the book of his poems, it's called In Moon Before Morning. In Moon Before Morning. And he's saying, um, thank you. Thank you for the homesickness that guides the young plovers from somewhere they loved before They woke into it, to another place they loved, before they ever saw it. So I'll I'll read that one again. Thank you for the homesickness that guides the young plovers from somewhere they loved before they woke into it, to another place they loved before they ever saw it. I think of this as the practice, that homesickness that keeps us going, yeah, to find the peace, the wisdom, the metta, karuna, mudita, upeka. So let's just sit for a few minutes.
so let that homesickness guide you. <laughs> and uh, see you next Sunday. And if you want to try this uh, abiding in kindness for the week, uh, when you remember it, please do. We can see how that goes this week. I think it's helpful. <laughs> Have a great week. Before we sign off, Michelle, someone had yeah. asked about the, the question and answer you read a bit from and uh, oh, sharing so, it. I oh, don't know that's if you're able to say anything about where that's coming from. Yeah. That is coming from the book I Am That by Sri Nazargadatta Maharaj. Good to see you all. Mm.